Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. I'm Mark Duggan, the Trioni Director of CEPR, and I'm very, very happy that you're here with us today. And we are in for a very, very timely discussion with Ben Harris, who until very recently served in the U.S. Treasury Department as the Chief Economist and the Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy. If there is anyone not currently in Washington, D.C., who can give us accurate insights into the debt ceiling situation and the likely impact of any deal that is struck it is Ben. Uh, this event, I hope, I, I think, is a great example of how CEPR tries uh, every quarter, every month, every week, we try to bring together influential people from the worlds of academia, public policy, and business to share ideas and perspectives that can ultimately lead to better economic policy outcomes. And I'm really grateful to all of our supporters who make the work that we do here possible, from events like this one today, to our next gen programs, to helping turbocharge the research productivity of our outstanding faculty. As you all know, our federal government is, I think, five days away from running out of uh, money to pay its bills, given that we have hit the debt limit and the accounting maneuvers that have been deployed over the last few months have pretty much been exhausted. The deal that has been struck bet between President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy just a few days ago requires major, required major concessions from both Republicans and Democrats. But as Ben apparently told the New York Times just a couple days ago, the agreement they reached won't have a huge impact on the overall economy. Okay, so we'll hear it. Uh, but we didn't at least default, which is good. As he put it, and I quote, the most important impact of the deal is the stability that comes with having a deal. But we don't yet technically have a deal. Incidentally, that article was written by Jim Tankersley, who spent a bunch of time with us here at CEPR as a media fellow and is one of the many reporters who regularly use our affiliated faculty as resources for the articles and their journalistic research. Of course, it isn't over until it's over, and both the House and Senate still need to vote for this deal to become a reality. And my understanding is that in about 25 minutes, the House will start voting. And they, I called up Kevin McCarthy and I said, can you hold off on voting? Because we have this CEPR event <laughs> at 5 p.m. and I don't want it all to be set by the time our event starts. So I would like to keep a little drama. And he said, sure, no problem, CEPR director. Uh, I can do that for you. Uh, so we, but we still, it's not, it's certainly not, there's the potential for surprises, but things look promising. I think we're super fortunate to have Ben here to make sure that we can see here the big picture. He'll be sharing his insights on not just the deal, not just the debt limit, but uh, the country's overall fiscal outlook and weigh in on the overall issues of the U.S. carrying more than $31 trillion in debt, which is a big number. He'll describe for us President Biden's budget proposal and contrast that with the Republican spending priorities and also help us look into the future and what we can expect in the days and months ahead with respect to U.S. economic policy and its impact on the global economy. As I mentioned, Ben recently left the Treasury Department. He started his, his role as Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic Policy when he was confirmed in late 2021, but he has been involved uh, with uh, helping the administration for quite some time even before that. And he stepped down, though, from this position uh, two months ago in March. Before joining the Treasury Department, he was the executive director of the Kellogg Public-Private Initiative and a research associate professor at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. He was also serving as chief economist for Results for America. Uh, earlier in his career, Ben served as Joe Biden's chief economist and economic advisor while he was the vice president. That opportunity came up in 2014 when Ben was working as the policy director of the Hamilton product, uh, Project at the Brookings Institution. Ben was actually on a trip here at Stanford with uh, Bob Rubin, Melissa Carney, and Karen Anderson, who were all at the Ham Hamilton Project at that time in 2014. And Bob Rubin, uh, the former Treasury Secretary, had just convinced Ben to continue his work at the Hamilton Project when the phone rang, I think while you were on campus or in the, while you were on the Stanford campus nine years ago, when the phone rang with the request for him to become Biden's chief economist. So I think he changed his career plans right then and there. Maybe Bob Rubin was sad, but Joe Biden was happy. And as he says, that kicked off an almost decade long ride uh, with uh, President Biden. 
it's a tremendous honor for us to have Ben with us today, uh, just as that ride has technically ended, and I'm super grateful for his time and perspectives. And the way this is gonna roll, Ben's gonna present for about 20-ish minutes, then he and I are gonna have a conversation, and then I'm gonna open it up for questions from all of you. But I won't necessarily do it, I may ask for questions uh, sooner, may intersperse if my questions, I'm sure each of you has better questions than I do, so please start thinking about whatever questions you would like to ask. And I believe Ben said, Something along the lines of, you can ask me anything about anything. True? Oh, and everything. <laughs> okay, <laughs> nice. Okay, so with that, please join me in welcoming Ben Harris to Seeper and get your questions ready for him. All right, thank you, Ben. Hi, all. Well, it's a huge honor to be here today. Uh, and as Mark said, the timing is just incredible. I mean, I've given a lot of talks over the course of my career. And sometimes you're looking backwards and explaining why things happen, and sometimes you're looking forward and explaining. Never are you talking about something that, as the House is voting in real time. This is a first and probably uh, a last for me. But uh, so I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes uh, with a real focus on the, the debt limit in the current episode. And if we have questions about the fiscal outlook for the United States, really anything else, we can maybe get to that during our discussion. Um, so just to go over some debt limit basics, just some sort of scene setting, and so we're all on the same page here. Um, so the debt ceiling serves as a cap on almost all government debt. 99% of government debt is subject to a limit. Uh, the current cap for probably the next uh, few days is $31.4 trillion. This includes both debt issued to the public, which is a more economically relevant uh, measure, which is 24.6 trillion, and intergovernmental debt, which measures 6.8 trillion, which is mainly debt held by large trust funds, primarily Social Security and, and Medicare. Um, the debt is largely due to prior deficits. Uh, so 97% of that 31.4 trillion was accumulated prior to the Biden administration. So it's really a cumulative measure. It's not so much uh, recent debt that's been, that's been incurred. Um, so the debt limit, which is completely unique to the United States, uh, is regularly raised by Congress or suspended. So sometimes they'll set a level and then they'll agree to set it higher. Um, or sometimes they say, look, we're just going to suspend the debt ceiling for a certain period of time. And so these suspensions became a bit more common over the past 10 years. Uh, but the debt limit has been raised or suspended 78 times since 1960, and it's not so typical that it's used as leverage for a negotiation. We saw this in 2011 when we got 10 years of budget caps, and we're seeing it uh, this year, but the debt ceiling was actually raised in 2013. The debt ceiling was raised three times during the Trump administration, and you probably didn't hear about it then uh, because for a variety of reasons, it just wasn't used as leverage for, uh, for, for legislative changes. But this time it is. And, uh, and so it's, it became a big deal, I think, in markets. It became a big deal in the news. It became a big deal in Washington, DC. So what happens when we actually hit the debt limit? So this most recent time, we hit the debt limit in January. Uh, and at that time, Treasury invokes extraordinary measures. And so these are really just accounting moves that Treasury uses to free up more room under the debt limit. Uh, there's really three big extraordinary measures uh, the G Fund, the Exchange Stabilization Fund, Civil Service Retirement. You don't really need to know the details, understand what's going on, but just to give you a quick example, so there's about $100 billion in non-marketable securities held in the G Fund. So there are you know, millions of federal employees, many of them save for retirement. Uh, you can choose different funds that you want to save in your federal 401k, and one of the funds is called the G Fund. So there's money the federal employees invest in the G Fund, uh, that generally counts under the debt limit. So that $100 billion or so counts as part of that $31.4 trillion. And one thing the Treasury can do is it can say, and, and so G Fund maturities, G Fund uh, bonds mature every day. And so Treasury can say, look, we need another $10 billion under the debt limit. We're going to basically write IOUs to all these federal employees and we're not gonna issue new debt. And maybe that'll free up you know, $10 billion in, in room. So it's basically swapping debt that counts under the debt limit for an IOU. And that's basically what's happening in these other, uh, in these other trust funds. It tends not to have a huge economic impact, 
Sometimes it's costly because you pay it back with interest, but in general, the impact is, is pretty, pretty small. Generally, extraordinary measures take about uh, two to six months or add about two to six months onto uh, the end when, when, we hit the, uh, when we hit the debt limit. And so you hear a lot about the X date. And the X date is like the drop dead date when everything gets really bad. And Treasury doesn't know when the X date is in advance because Treasury doesn't know what receipts it will look like. So Janet Yellen, Secretary Yellen, uh, when I was at Treasury, you know, every so often she'd write a letter to Speaker McCarthy saying when she thought the X date would be. And it starts off as a wide range. And then this year we got to uh, mid-April when receipts come in. And we started to have a better idea about when we would hit the X date. So it becomes more precise over time. Um, so we, we had about 4.5 months between when we actually hit the debt ceiling and when all of these extraordinary measures uh, evaporated. The cost of brinksmanship, the cost of coming up close to the debt ceiling is very different based on what the political circumstances are of the particular episode. So 2011 was probably the worst example of brinksmanship. That's when markets really believed there was a substantial chance that we might see some sort of default or we might see some sort of situation where Treasury couldn't pay all of its bills. And it was truly chaotic. I mean, equities fell by 17% in the weeks and months leading up to the X date. We saw a one-day fall of about 5%. Of course, you never know why equities fall precisely, but it was pretty clear that it, much of that was related to the, the uh, debt ceiling. Credit markets were roiled, so spreads on corporate debt, on triple B corporate debt, rose by 56 basis points. Spreads on mortgage debt rose by 70 basis points. Consumer confidence, business confidence steadily fell until we got a resolution and then it steadily rose. Uh, and the VIX, which is a measure of financial volatility, just soared. So this is probably the worst example we've seen of brinksmanship. We did not go over the X state. We did not default on our debt. Treasury was able to make all of its payments. So crisis was, was avoided. We got uh, a budget act called the Budget Control Act of 2011, which put in place 10 years of budget caps. Um, but all of that financial volatility went away as soon as we got, we got a deal. Uh, in 2013, brinksmanship was pretty muted. And markets really believed that Treasury would make all of the payments on its debt. There was some examples of uh, some financial stress. But in general, equity markets looked pretty solid. Credit markets looked pretty solid. Uh, the, one, the one exception to this was for one-month treasuries that were auctioned off in early May that were set to be uh, redeemed in early June. Investors charged a pretty high price for those, a historically high price. They're charging a, a little over 5.5%, uh, which we've never seen. That's on an annual basis. But we've never seen that on a one-month bill before. So other than that, though, I think there was just this belief that Congress would come together and find a resolution. It was very different than 2011. But what would happen if we actually breached the debt limit, if we reached the X date and Congress didn't raise the debt ceiling? And there's a lot of confusion about this. And it's reasonable confusion because we've never done it before. Uh, so this occurs when Treasury can no, no longer issue any more debt to pay all of its bills. And it's basically in a situation where it can only pay bills based on revenue that's coming in. Uh, so it must rely exclusively on cash inflows. Uh, maturing debt gets rolled over with new auctions. So uh, Treasury often does a couple different auctions a week. And as that debt gets matured, uh, it would roll it over and issue new debt. But it's really relying on the cash flow that's coming in from revenues in order to pay any new any new uh, bills that, that come up. Um, but the outcomes are really uncertain. We don't know what would happen. So we hear a lot about prioritization. So the White House and Treasury basically have two broad options if we hit the debt ceiling. The first is prioritization, which is basically saying Treasury would have to decide what bills it would pay and what bills it wouldn't pay. And the widespread assumption is that Treasury would firewall payments on debt and then wait till it had enough cash to pay all their bills within a day. So if you have, let's say, $80 billion in a Social Security payment that's scheduled to go out for a certain day, and you have 
$50 billion in other payments, you have to wait till you have $130 billion to make any payments. And that's the assumption around prioritization. Uh, but the, th the key part about prioritization is that all payments on Treasury debt would be made. And that's really what financial markets mostly care about. They want to make sure that these payments on the bonds continue. They want to make sure that if a bond matures, they'll get the money. Uh, and so the assumption in financial markets has been that there would be some sort of prioritization. I have tried to explain. I spent a lot of time talking to people in financial markets. I think this is a mistaken assumption. So the assumption that, that the Treasury would prioritize was largely based on this transcript that came out in 2013 in which then Fed Chair Ben Bernanke was talking about different plans to address the debt ceiling. But my point is, is it's not Ben Bernanke's choice. It's not Jay Powell's choice. And it's really not Janet Yellen's choice whether or not Treasury prioritizes. It's Joe Biden's choice. And I'd spent a lot of time with President Biden over the course of my career, and we never had a discussion about this. I don't know what he would decide. Um, so my point is, is that it comes down to one person deciding how they would make payments if we went over the X date. Uh, and that one person has not weighed in on this. So I, my point to financial markets is don't be so sure. The second thing is that you could pursue a workaround. And so you heard a lot about things like the 14th Amendment, uh, which guarantees the full faith and credit of the United States. You heard examples of saying, oh, can't Treasury just mint uh, a trillion dollar coin and put it in an account at the Fed? Uh, then you heard you know, other things like, oh, maybe Treasury should just sell gold bars. My point has been these aren't really solutions because they often come under this cloud of legal uncertainty. And you don't want to have a situation where you're having a financial crisis and a constitutional crisis at the exact same time. Now, maybe if you invoke the 14th Amendment, you could temporarily get around these tough choices that are in the prior bullet, but it doesn't really calm markets. I mean, if you're sort of invoking the Constitution uh, to get around the, the debt ceiling, I don't think everything would be going swimmingly. So you really need a solution out of Congress. Um, how long we can go past the debt ceiling, and the choices around prioritization depend critically on the day and the month that we hit. So on outflows, for example, uh, Social Security, which is, you know, comprises of, uh, a very large share of the federal budget, Social Security is paid on the second, third, and fourth Wednesday of every month. It's based uh, alphabetically on, on people's last names. So you have about 60 billion Social Security beneficiaries so on the second Wednesday, about 20 billion people receive their checks. On the third Wednesday, another 20 billion. Um, and s million, thank you. We, yeah, I'm, I'm growing the world's population really quickly. <laughs> um, so yeah, about 20 million, 20 million, 20 million. And so if you hit an X date the day before one of these Wednesday payments, that's going to look really different than if you hit an X date on, say, the third or fourth of the month. But cash flows also are very much dependent on what month we're in. We obviously have big payments in April, big payments in September. Uh, we've got estimated tax payments in June, which make for uh, cash flow to be close to zero. But my point here is, is that not all X dates are created equal. It really matters where in the month you're hitting, and it matters what month you're hitting. Um, I'll say this time. Let me just go back for a second. This time was really interesting because uh, Secretary Yellen had said that we're going to hit the X date on June 5th. We eventually settled on, on June 5th after we had a fair amount of precision with, uh, with incoming receipts. The interesting thing was is that if you get to June 14th, that's when estimated tax payments start coming in because these quarterly tax payments which are due June 14th and June 15th. So it wasn't like you would hit the X date and then everything would be terrible for forever and ever. Treasury just had to get to June 14th or June 15th, after which time all this extra money comes in. And then you get to June 30th, and on June 30th, there was a new extraordinary measure which, which came up, which would free up another 150 billion or so under the, the debt ceiling, which would get you to, uh, to mid-July. To mid so I was asked a lot of times, people say, well, how would you advise Secretary Yellen if you were in Treasury? And I would have said, well, maybe one option is to come up with some sort of extraordinary measure which gets you to June 14th because then you're in the clear well into July, which isn't necessarily saying that the problem would be solved, but it would have bought you a lot more time. So this is just another point of why the day you hit the X date really matters. 
So what are the economic impacts of a breach? I mean, again, we really have no idea. We've never done this before. Uh, some people told me in financial markets, no, this is actually good for treasuries because you'll see a flight to safety. And that given all of this financial volatility, investors will want to go and, and buy what's safe, which is US treasuries. Uh, some people completely disagree with that view. Um, but I think in general, a credit downgrade is almost assured. We saw this in 2011. Uh, plus, is my view, I think that you'd see a rise in interest rates. I think that investors would want to be compensated for this newfound risk. We've gone decades and decades and decades with treasury bonds being seen as being completely risk-free from a credit perspective. And surrendering that would certainly come with some sort of uh, cost. Uh, you would see a decline in consumer and business confidence like we saw in 2011, which has, uh, depending on the decline, potentially severe economic impacts. You would see a sharp stock market decline. You would see the impact of disrupted government payments. And so if you look at, for example, Moody's.com and Mark Zandi, Mark Zandi thinks this would kick off a recession for a lot of different reasons. And one of the reasons he thinks it would kick off a recession is because the economic impact, say, of 20 million Social Security beneficiaries who have gotten their checks at the same day, on the same, you know, monthly for years, not getting their checks. Uh, and that would cause uh, a decline in consumer spending, which would kick off a recession. But then there's also an economic impact, which is the, the economic impact of the resolution. And so uh, if, for example, if in order to get to a resolution, you needed to jack up tax rates or to really uh, sharply cut spending, that has an economic impact as well. And so the Budget Control Act of 2011 had a fairly sizable macroeconomic impact because it, at least in projections, because it impacted spending so much. So you have to account for all these different factors when you consider what the impact uh, of a breach would be. So the table on the right here, uh, by President Biden's Council of Economic Advisors. So, you know, admittedly, uh, probably a partisan, a partisan calculation, but I think it's I think it's in line with with largely what you're seeing out of analysts. They're seeing the cost of brinksmanship is about 200,000 jobs, uh, real GDP in annualized terms declining by about 0.3 percent, um, and a modest impact on employment. But as you start having longer and longer defaults, the economic impacts go up. This is completely in line with Moody's.com that found you could lose 7 million jobs with a protracted default. So it's not just whether or not you default, it's for how long that lasts for, uh, in part because of the, the economic impacts of delayed government payments. So do we have a deal? Again, this is great timing. I can tell you in about an hour and a half if the House has, has passed this or not. Uh, but so we got this deal from the White House and the House Republicans, which was, re which was agreed to last weekend, uh, called the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2023. The general contours of the deal, if you ask me to describe it in one sentence, it's that it was basically two years of binding caps on discretionary spending, we'll get to that in a second, plus other modest policy changes. We don't know yet if it's passed the House, it faces an uncertain future in the Senate, but should pass before the June 5th X date. Uh, Senator McConnell has come out and said it will most assuredly pass, and so I think the assumption is that it will, it will pass. Um, total deficit reduction over 10 years could be between 250 billion and 1.5 trillion, depending critically on one assumption, which is, and we'll get to this, what happens to discretionary spending after the two years of budget caps. So I talked a lot about discretionary spending, so let me back up for a second. The federal budget basically has mandatory spending, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, spending that goes on regardless if Congress gets out of bed in the morning. And then it has discretionary spending. And discretionary spending is kind of for everything else, but it's for uh, uh, nutrition programs, it's for uh, intelligence, it's in for defense spending, it's for things like TSA. In general, I think of discretionary spending as like public goods. That's not entirely right, because there are certain things that are transfers. But in general, it's sort of like government investment. Um, and then mandatory spending are the big entitlement programs. And so discretionary spending makes up about 25% of the federal budget. And roughly half goes to defense, and roughly half goes to non-defense. Uh, a little more to defense, but, but more or less it's split. 
the key about this, about, this, about this resolution was that it put caps on discretionary spending for the next two years. These are enforceable caps. Uh, I think most people think that they'll be adhered to. And then after that, it's, these are non-binding caps. The reason we get to two, if you think that it's 250 in deficit reduction, that's if you think that only the two years will be binding. And then after that, Congress would do what it would have done in the absence of the caps. CBO scored it at 1.5 trillion because they said, and they have to assume, that discretionary spending increases at the rate of inflation. So when you drop the level of the caps for 2024 and 2025, and then assume it grows at the rate of inflation afterwards, you're starting at a lower base. And that's where the savings come in. So CBO doesn't think that the caps will be binding after, and CBO is a congressional budget office, they're the official score. I'm using a ton of wonky words here, and I apologize. I'm happy to explain them. But CBO is the, the official score for, for the budget. And so they came out, you know, get big bills. CBO says what the economic impacts are. And they said it's going to be $1.5 trillion because they assumed that uh, they have to assume that discretionary spending grows at the rate of inflation. And because you're dropping the base for the rate of growth afterwards, that's where you're getting all the savings. That's where you're getting the $1.5 trillion. Um, now, that's a big assumption. So, you know, a lot of people I would speak to say, no, it's more like 500 billion, or it's more like 800 billion, or some people think it's 250. Uh, but you can kind of choose your own adventure. That's the way I think Jim Tankersley, who you referenced, put it in Twitter. It's a choose your own adventure. You know, if you want to say this is a big $1.5 trillion bill, then you can say, yeah, discretionary spending will grow off that smaller base. If you want to say it's only 250, you can make a case for that as well. I don't have a crystal ball, I don't know what it will be but I can explain why CBO got to where it got. All right, so for the last little bit here, I'm gonna talk about the seven main elements of the deal, and then we'll turn this into a conversation. Uh, the first, as we talked about it, these are cuts in discretionary spending. Uh, we talked about uh, discretionary spending makes about a quarter of federal spending. Um, in general, in, in practice, so this is it's a little difficult to talk about because this particular bill involved some handshake agreements between the White House and the House of Representatives around what they would do in future appropriations bills, around future discussions around discretionary spending. But in general, I think most people think that for defense in 2024, it goes up by about 3%, uh, and then 1% in 2025. And for non-defense spending, non-defense discretionary spending is flat in 2024 and about 1% in 2025. So the total cuts for these two amount to about $250 billion, um, and as we talked about, the lower base will influence the spending in the out years. The chart on the, on the right is from Goldman Sachs, and so you can say who won and who lost maybe, or compared to what, what folks asked for. So the blue line is what CBO had assumed you'd see for discretionary spending before all this started. The, uh, the dotted black line is what the White House proposed. The green line was what the House passed uh, about a month ago. Uh, and we eventually landed on the solid red line. That's after you get past all these sort of like handshake deals and, and adjustments. So pretty close to what the White House initially assumed, but a little bit lower. And very far away from the green line, what the House passed in their initial bill about a, a month ago. And, but also pretty far below the uh, CBO's blue line. So if you really want to be, if you're you know, very concerned about deficits and you think that discretionary spending is where we should look to cut, uh, the gap between the blue line and the red line should give you some optimism. The second main element of the bill was rescission of COVID funds. If you actually look at the text of the bill, they list 81 different accounts they're cutting from. Not all of the accounts for COVID funds were cut, so some for housing stability were not cut. But these, the cuts in the 81 different bills total about 20 billion, 28 billion. The third major part is a partial rollback of IRS funding. So the Inflation Reduction Act, which passed in 2022, which was kind of President Biden's signature bill, was largely directed at, uh, at climate change, included hundreds of billions of dollars of tax incentives for investment in uh, clean energy production, but it had to be paid for. And one of the big pay-fors in that bill 
was $80 billion in new funding for the IRS to be spent over the next eight years. And the reason it's to pay for is because if you give the IRS a dollar, they'll be able to uh, direct their enforcement activity in such a way that it brings back more than a dollar. So Republicans in the House really hate this extra $80 billion in spending for the IRS. It's a complete political football. Uh, and so they were able to get this sort of handshake deal where, they, uh, where the IRS would not use $20 billion of that 80. Uh, the assumption is, is that IRS will continue to use the remaining 60 in the near term, and that $20 billion will come from the end of the eight-year window. Uh, but we'll see over the next few years exactly what happens. The fourth main part of the, of the bill is an end to the student loan pause. Uh, so the Biden administration had a big student loan forgiveness plan. As part of that, they said, we will continue the pause on student loan payments, which is about $5 billion a month. So student loan borrowers don't have to, can, they can continue to not pay, make those payments. But the Biden administration said, uh, you're going to have to start making those payments again 60 days after the Supreme Court rules on the forgiveness plan. That was all done through administrative action. It wasn't done through, through Congress. What this does in this bill is it says, look, starting September 1st, you're going to have to start making these student loan payments again. Uh, some people have said, that this is the most economically significant part of the bill. Um, I don't think so. I think that the Supreme Court would have ruled and they would have picked up again. The fifth change is to, to work requirements. This is really uh, uh, very political. Uh, initially, Repu the Republican bill that passed about a month ago, they had about $120 billion in uh, offsets that were raised by introducing work requirements to people on Medicaid, so public health programs. Uh, but also to SNAP, which is nutrition benefits, and TANF, which is uh, uh, cash transfers. What happened in the eventual, I'm getting really in the weeds here, so I'll try to be quick. What happened in the resolution was that, so in the current, under current uh, food stamp benefits, if you're an able-bodied adult and you're younger than 49, you have to have uh, some demonstration that you're working after a short period of time of getting SNAP benefits. Um, but if you're 50, you don't have to have those demonstration of, of working. What this bill does, it says if you're between 50 and 54, you now have to demonstrate that you're working to receive SNAP, the, the, food, the food stamp benefits. But it also said there are new exemptions for people who, regardless of your age, you don't have to show that you're working. And so these are people who are homeless, these are veterans, and these are people, uh, usually younger people, who are coming out of foster care. And the net change in this was actually to add more people to, uh, to, to food stamps. It's been, it's really interesting. I mean, here you have like the, the bean counters at the Congressional Budget Office, and members of the House are really upset about this finding because they wanted to see uh, the number of beneficiaries go down. Democrats were really worried about this gutting some of these programs, uh, but ultimately you'll see another 78,000 people added to food stamps as a result of this. The sixth, and everything I know about this is written on this slide, so I really don't know more than this, but there is permitting reform that was included in this. Um, this is a big idea. This is a big uh, priority for Senator Manchin, uh, but overall this is, could be considered modest permitting reform that basically says as you have environmental reviews for va various energy projects that uh, you have one lead agency which is in charge of going over the various reviews. It also puts uh, caps on the amount of time that you could have for environmental impact statements and things like that. And lastly, it allows uh, the fast tracking of what's called the Mountain Valley Pipeline, which is the methane pipeline which runs through uh, West Virginia, which Senator Manchin is really, really happy about. Lastly, and then I'm all done here, uh, you get a suspension of the debt ceiling, which is the best news possible from my view, uh, the most economically significant part of this whole thing, which is suspended through January 1st, 2025. It had to be after the election. I think there's no way the Biden administration would agree to anything else. Um, on this date, January 1st, 2025, the debt ceiling will be reinstated to whatever level, so 31.4, which is the current level, plus what is, was ever was spent between uh, when the bill was passed and January 1st. So we think it's going to be about $4 trillion 
So the new debt ceiling level will be around 35.5 trillion, uh, after which time Treasury will probably need to start taking extraordinary measures and we go through all of this all over again. There was also a provision that said Treasury can't just go during the suspension period and issue a ton of debt and build up this huge you know, war chest or a ton of cash. Uh, Treasury has to stick to what's called prudent, uh, prudent policy, which it can't raise more than uh, enough cash to pay for one week worth of, of payments. This was incredibly wonky. I hope you saw sort of the big, the big picture through all of this. But basically, we got a resolution. No one will have to hear about the debt ceiling for at least another 18 months or so, probably longer. Whether or not you got true deficit reduction depends critically on what you expect to happen to the way that Congress does these annual appropriations after 2025. So if you think that they'll just go up in 2026 to whatever level they would have done in the absence of these caps, we're talking about 250 billion or so in deficit reduction. But if you think they'll use 2025 as a reference to start spending in 2026, and then 2027, they'll use 2026, then you're getting more like 1.5 trillion. Um, so anyway, I look forward to the discussion. I look forward to your questions, and uh, and thank you. Thanks, Ben. <clears throat> that was great. I will confess over the last few weeks that I've been in this kind of weird position of just hoping that Congress didn't reach a deal on the debt limit before your event. So. <laughs> flirting with economic disaster for the country, but still a timely CEPA <laughs> event. Anyway, it worked, out just, it worked out just fine. But in any case, so can you give us at a high level as you think about this bill, um, and I'm actually surprised that it, it seems to be going okay, who do you view as the big winners? And who are the big losers beyond people who are worried about the national debt? So in political terms, I think this is kind of a draw. Uh, I mean, the Biden administration had to give up some things it didn't want. It had to basically... IRS stuff, for example. What, what, which one of these items hurt, do you think, like, was the... Did they land the biggest punch to the, the Democratic priorities? The say? IRS stuff hurts, but because the IRS has discretion as far as when they're going to spend this remaining 60 billion, that won't be felt for, for quite some time. Okay. Uh, I think that the discretionary spending caps probably didn't hurt that badly because Republicans in the House control the Appropriations Committee for the House and so would have full discretion over what would have been spent anyway. So, like, you know, and, and, and they control the House for the next two years. So, did those hurt? I mean, maybe they hurt, but not relative to what you would have had in the absence of this deal, because the Appropriations Committee could have done anything it wanted. Um, the student loan pause probably would have happened anyway. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is I don't think either side had to give up very much. Okay. Um, you know, they both had to give up a Joe little. Joe Manchin's happy, right? Joe Manchin's thrilled. There's this huge pipeline. Joe yeah. um, you know, and the fact that you may get some of the projects, the permitting reform is, is kind of a big deal. Because I think that as we head into the 2024 election, if we're starting to see some of these energy projects get built, that's tangible economic progress that people will see. And that was due to the Inflation and Reduction Act, which was decidedly uh, a democratic priority. So, um, but in general, I think that I can't really tell you how much this mattered until 2026. Okay, uh, good. Okay, so you used the number in there. Uh, which was 35 trillion, which is about where you expect the debt to be in January 2025. And that projection made me a little sad because that's a big delta from 31.4. That's a 3.6, $4 trillion delta over less than two years. This got, like that seems <laughs> like a lot, a big, and so it, it is, for people to be patting themselves, like, I don't know, I, that's troubling to me. When, when, when George W. Bush took office in 2001, I believe the federal debt was $4 trillion. I know the world's very different. We've had inflation and so forth, but that's a big delta in the deficit debt over a very short period of time. So can you talk a little bit yeah. about that? So two of my favorite economists, 
are Larry Summers and Jason Furman. I admire both of them very deeply. We've had both of them speak at Seed very recently, yeah. in fact. Yeah. They have been, I think, leaders in ways to think around the, the debt. And Jason actually tweeted this out the other day. I, I should say, I, this is like the third time I've referenced Twitter. I usually don't spend a lot of time on Twitter. Know, but like, doing, during the debt ceiling, Twitter I've been like stuff. living on it. Um, <laughs> because things are happening. American so. Economic Review. Like, no, 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 no. I mean, I've sent like nine <laughs> tweets no. in my life. So, it, um, but, but Jason tweeted something out the other day and it was four rules to discuss uh, fiscal burden and concerns. And one was never talk about things in nominal terms. Never talk about the nominal level, never talk about, and which I think is right. Like, one of the interesting th things that happened during 2021 and part of 2022 when we had all this inflation was our debt to GDP ratio actually went down. And, you know, economists know that inflation is not a great thing, but if you're actually a debt holder, it can be a great thing as we inflate away the debt. So uh, I think it's really important to talk about, I'm worried about our long-term uh, fiscal situation. I spent the first 10 years of my career writing a lot about this, but I don't think the right way to talk about it is in big nominal numbers. I think the right way to talk about it is in when we talk about sort of primary deficits. So like after you take out interest spending, how, what's, what's the gap between what we're bringing in revenue and what we're spending? We have a real problem. We have a long-term primary deficit of uh, a little over 3% that's getting slightly worse over time. 3% of GDP? 3% of GDP, which is just, it's just too big. I mean, that can't continue indefinitely. Um, that's excluding the interest. That's excluding the interest. Because the interest, so just today, the Washington Post has this really nice visual that I encourage you to have a look at, which is as a percent of GDP, what's gonna happen to Social Security, what's gonna happen to federal health care programs, those both look they're rising, but the one that's rising the most is interest. Yeah. So maybe, because we had actually um, your form, recent boss, Janet Yellen here, uh, 15 months ago for, for our economic summit. And she was terrific, but we asked her about the debt. John, right here, asked her about her, her former, she was your TA or you were her TA? Okay, okay, great. So he asked her about the, the debt and was she concerned about the debt? And she said she was, but she also pointed out that the interest payments as a share of GDP, which you like that measure, right, uh, were lower you know, 15 months ago than they were, let's say, 20 years ago. Yeah. Right, so maybe not such a big problem, but we've had a big rise in interest rates. So it is, I, I, can you talk a little bit about that? Because this long-term budget challenge is not, this, that, that's not what is going to get addressed in these budget negotiations. When, when you have increases in interest rates, those don't usually happen in a vacuum. Usually they're being driven up because you're having, the Fed has to rise interest yeah. rates because we have high inflation. Right. So I think, I mean, I think that the, the key is, is, again, looking at this gap in the primary deficit. Now, you're right, 100%. I mean, you're completely right to point to this uh, Social Security and the composition of the federal deficit and what's going on. I mean, my big concern, and I, I alluded to this when I was talking, which is that we think about public goods, so spending on things that make us a richer country, spending on education, spending on research, uh, uh, maybe spending on I don't know, climate change mitigation, those type of things are shrinking. They've been shrinking for a really long time. And so if you really care about how rich our country is going to be, in 10, 20, 30 years, and public goods are just contracting, and it's not being picked up in other parts of the economy, that's, that has implications for, for our growth rates. So, and you mentioned health. I mean, health is where the real pressure is coming from. There's a lot of pressure from Social Security, but the growth rate in health expenditures is a massive problem, and, uh, and we don't have really any end in sight. We had a Social Security policy forum here about six weeks ago, which was terrific. And one of the things that came out from that by Peter Orzag, former CBO director, for, former OMB director, is that federal health spending has actually gone up less than was expected 10 or 12 years ago. Social Security has actually financially gotten in worse shape over that same time period. But in any case, that, that was one. So Peter probably used the term bending the health care cost curve. Right, he did And that. so it is true, but with ACA, uh, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, uh, which was passed in 2009, I think. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I think we saw a change in the expected growth rate of healthcare spending. Right. 
but it's still not fixed. Okay, great. And now, so you're not in Washington, D.C. I'm going to open it up for questions after uh, this, this last thing. But so I'm sure you've co-authored papers before, and you may, maybe you're sending around a version of the paper where someone holds the pen. And I'm just trying to understand who holds the pen? Who held the pen on this thing <laughs> at various points? Can you just give us a, a, any l insight? There just seems like a feeding frenzy of influential people who are involved. And obviously you weren't you, you've, you wrapped up in March, but you may have an estimate of who are the, who are the key players, agencies, committees, yeah. center, like, and so forth. Is it Kevin McCarthy and Joe Biden kicking it back and forth, track change, Microsoft Word document? <laughs> I kind of don't think that's... So, so three things on this. <laughs> three, it's a great question. Three things on this. First of all, okay, in this most recent time, uh, President Biden was completely clear about who was doing the negotiating, which was Shalonda Young, who's running... Uh, OMB, it was Steve Reschetti, who is my old boss, but uh, a counselor to the president. And it was Louisa Terrell, who runs uh, uh, legislative affairs at the White House. And then it was Kevin McCarthy and his leadership team in the House. But it really depends. So in 2021. No, I didn't hear you mention any PhD economists. In that. No. <laughs> uh, but in 2021, and I was, I was pretty heavily involved in that negotiation. That was with the Senate, and, uh, and OMB wasn't as involved in there. Shalanda didn't play such a big role. Her expertise was really helpful here because she used to be, uh, I think, the chief of staff of the Appropriations Committee. And as we saw, uh, discretionary spending was a big deal. But my point here is it just depends on each instance. That's the first point. The second point is that, um, is that oftentimes people are involved in ways that they don't know they're involved. And so when I was Vice President Biden, then Vice President Biden's chief economist, and towards the end of the second term in the Obama administration, he was doing this interview with New York Magazine, and they were asking him to sort of recount some of the things he was most proud of, and he was talking about negotiating the end of the fiscal cliff. Do you guys remember that in 2012? Um, and he was talking about how important the CA and out, CEA, Council of Economic Advisors, which uh, we're both alums of, uh, how important that analysis was. And at the time, I was there with uh, uh, Professor Jim Stock and, and Alan Kruger, who's ahead. And I was like up until two or three in the morning working with a small team doing all these projections. And we kind of, we'd can over the chair. And I had no idea. I had no idea it was going to the vice president. I had no idea that he was using these projections. And like, you know, I don't know, seven years later, I'm sitting in the vice president's office and he's citing this work I did. So sometimes you're contributing right. you in ways that you, don't, that you don't okay. know. And the third thing I'll say, you know, for most of my career, I've not been the person in the room. But in 2021, when we tried to pass the Build Back Better Act, I was, among many, many other people. And it's just fascinating to see. Right. I mean, it is. Until you're in the room, you can't imagine how just <laughs> crazy and disorganized it is. Oh, that's really inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, David, you got a question, right? right. Oh, let, wait for the uh, microphone, please. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, we, we talked about going from 31 trillion and change to 35 trillion and change. Obviously, that's a function of a few assumptions, right? The inflows versus outflows, discretionary, non-discretionary, et cetera. It's also a function of rates, though, right? What, 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 what's the assumption that's built into that 35 about what the Fed does with rates over the next two years? I mean, it makes a huge difference, huh? It, it, makes, it, makes, it makes a difference. The Congressional Budget Office has assumptions about rates. Uh, they have a terminal rate for the 10-year, and then I think that they mechanically adjust off of that. And so I think after, and I'm really, I mean, I sh I sh maybe I should know this, um, but my, I think what they do is after two or three years, they assume we go down for the 10 year rate. My guess is in the high twos. But this is 35 by 2000, by uh, 2025. Oh, yeah, yeah, so you're right, you're right. So what, what, yeah, you're right. So what's the short term, what's it? But, but what they do is they, they think about the long term terminal rate for the 10 year, and then they get to sort of a glide path. So I don't think they're in a situation where they're saying, okay, in June we think they're gonna hike or not hike. They just have these kind of mechanical assumptions where they assume we're eventually gonna get to the terminal rate over time. Oh, it's usually wildly wrong. Um, but it's, you know, projecting monetary policy. I mean, who was right over the past two or three years? Uh, if you were, you'd be a wealthy person. Right, 
Okay, who, uh, who else, more questions from the audience? Jeanette? Okay, we need a, but we need a microphone over here. Uh, Ashley, can you help out with that? <laughs> you don't need a microphone. Yeah. We, want, um, we all want to hear you. So I'm, I'm quoting from Jim Tankersley in the New York Times 23 minutes ago. He says, the debate has evolved, has devolved into an argument about the IRS enforcement as we all predicted months ago, right? So he's talking, it's, they're waiting for the vote. It, <laughs> I have no particular love for the IRS, my husband even less, I agree. Mm -hmm. But really, I, I, don't, I can't explain this to the average 25-year-old as to why there is so much fighting about funding the IRS when the systems are antiquated and all they presumably would be doing would be following the rules. So how, what's your explanation for this? So I'm a little mystified by this too. My view around IRS spending, so first of all, if everyone who owed taxes paid their taxes, we would not have a fiscal problem, right? Like we would not be talking about 35 trillion or 31, we'd talk about zero. Uh, we would have a very different fiscal outlook. Uh, the distribution or the patterns for people who don't pay their taxes are not uniform. Basically, if you're getting a paycheck from someone else, you're probably paying almost all of your taxes. So tax evasion is very concentrated in a small group uh, of, of taxpayers. Also, why aren't people who pay their taxes really pissed off about this? I mean, it's not just a revenue issue, it's a competition issue. And one thing I, w I wish we did a better job of doing was explaining why this is really a fundamental issue of fairness. If you're a dry cleaner who pays your taxes and the dry cleaner next door decides they're not going to pay their taxes and you have an IRS which is so weak that it can't even go after the dry cleaner who doesn't pay their taxes, well, isn't the honest dry cleaner frustrated? The, lower, the, the dry cleaner who evades their taxes can charge lower prices, make higher profits, can expand. This is fundamentally a competition issue. I think that people see the IRS as an example or a symbol of a government which is too big. I think they see the IRS as an example of government overreach, which is intrusive and in getting into their business, rather than as an agency which facilitates payment, which allows social services and other things that people like, um, or ra rather seeing it as kind of like a referee which makes sure that everything's fair. And uh, I will say, I mean, when we, I, I mentioned earlier, we tried to get the Build Back Better bill through Congress. We actually got it through the House, which when I look back over the course of my career, things I'm proud of, that will probably be one of them. And that was a sweeping bill. I mean, this is like universal pre-K, tons for climate, um, child care would have been heavily subsidized, you would have had a lot more women, could have been in the workforce, what a huge, huge bill. We came up one vote short in the Senate. We did get it through the House. There was one provision uh, in addition to this 80 billion that made it through the house, and it was on the information that was shared with the IRS. So right now, when you have a bank account, if you have more than $10 in your bank account, that bank reports to the IRS uh, how much you have in that, in that bank account, or interest payments on that bank account. And what we said was, okay, let's add two pieces of information, money in and money out. And what that did is it would tell the IRS, look, if you have a bank account where you had uh, $400,000 coming in and only $100,000 going out and you report on your tax return that you only made $20,000, well maybe we should flag this account. It's called information reporting. And that just, I mean, the rage that that engendered in some people. I mean, again, th the information in your account has already been reported to the IRS. We're just adding inflows and outflows in the account. And over time the idea is to allow the IRS to do its job better. Uh, and that was a tough vote for a lot of people in the House. Uh, but it did pass the House, obviously on partisan lines. So the IRS is just, I mean, it's a flashpoint. And I don't completely understand why it makes people so angry. Chris, can you get John right down here? So I just have a very simple question about the spending caps. As I understand it, the discretionary spending will be flat in 24 and up 1% in 25. The question is, is that up 1% in real terms, inflation adjusted, or is that in nominal terms? I just don't know. It doesn't strike me that saying you'll spend 1% more in real terms is a very binding spending cap. 
So great question. And so defense goes up by 3% next year, but as you referenced, non-defense discretionary is flat. And then it goes up by 1% in nominal terms after that. And uh, uh, so believe it or not, like people who aren't elected officials, and even some who are from different parties, actually get along pretty well in Washington in certain circumstances. So I regularly have dinner with a lot of people who used to have senior jobs uh, in Republican administrations. And when they were predicting where the nominal increase was going to be, they said it has to be below 2% because that's the Fed's target for inflation. They said, you know, maybe it'll be flat, maybe it'll grow by 1.9%, but that was the range. And so Republicans in the House had to feel like you were getting inflation-adjusted cuts. So that 1% increase is nominal. OK, great. Uh, Jim, swing it. Yeah, Chris, you get a question right here. Yeah. And then, yeah, thank you. Uh, there's, <clears throat> there's been times where, where there's been one party controlling the, the uh, government, all the houses, and it's been either Republicans or Democrats, they didn't get rid of the debt limit. Is it that both parties would like to have it for one reason or other, and, or let's do it the converse, if some, somehow it happens that the Republicans get all control of the government, is there a chance that they'll get rid of the, the debt limit? Because I think we can all agree that's the stupidest rule <laughs> that you could ever possibly have for fiscal management. Uh, is this a great question? And I don't, I don't really have an answer. Uh, but what can I tell you? So first of all, I mean, it seems it's been advantageous to Republicans over the past 10 years or so. In 2011, they got 10 years of budget caps. It was seen as a win. And I think that Republicans will see this as at least a small win, at least relative to the status quo. Democrats have at times, I mean, Secretary Yellen said that she wanted to abolish it. Um, but, you know, it, A, it's a fundraising opportunity for members of Congress. I mean, it's a great time for them to, to raise money. It was when you talk about something big like this. Um, I don't think, I mean, I guess one question you could also ask is when, in the first two years of the Biden administration, why didn't you just raise the debt limit to some really big number and be done with it. And I think the answer was, well, you had 50 votes in the Senate. And for some members of the Senate, coming in with a really big number, they felt was politically dangerous. Now, you all can judge. Do you think that anyone would say, well, I voted for a senator. I'm OK with them raising the debt limit by $3 trillion, but not by eight. I mean, you have this like really esoteric construct that no one understands. And then you're attaching kind of obscure numbers to it that are so big, it's tough to. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, think that, I think that there were at least enough senators in the first two years of the Biden administration who were worried about a big debt, a big number, that we had to come in pretty small. And we've had to deal with this twice now. OK, we've got one more question in the queue from Megan. And then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Megan. Hi, uh, my name is Megan. I'm an undergraduate student here. and. Over the past four years, every time I've learned about the debt ceiling, I kind of wonder what the point of it is if it's been revised 78 times. Um, and I know you mentioned like this is a concept very unique to the United States. So I guess my question to you is, what is the point of it? Is it just, you know, every 18 months it's like a test of political practice or it's a time for us to sit there and reevaluate our spending habits, like cut COVID budgets, like cut discretionary spending? Um, it just seems like very arbitrary to me. Um, and I was wondering from your perspective what the actual point of it is. Yeah, so, I mean, it is kind of arbitrary, right? Like Congress, every dollar of spending had to be appropriated by Congress, either in an initial bill, like when Congress created Social Security, or in annual appropriations bills. So like, you already said the spending was okay, and you already designed the tax code, so you already gave that the thumbs up. So if you're okay with the spending, you're okay with the tax code, then how can you not be okay with the borrowing, which is the difference between the two? Like it's a little bit, it's kind of counterintuitive. I mean, it's like telling one of my daughters, yeah, it's fine to go buy an ice cream cone and then yelling at her for buying an ice cream cone. Um, but I think in practice what it does, I mean, some people see it as a limit on, on too much borrowing. And periodically asking yourself, look, is this, are we comfortable with this level of borrowing? And the fact that twice over the past 12 years we've now got at least modest deficit reduction bills, I think means that this probably here to stay. Okay, great. So 
We can wrap it up here. So I'll just say this is our final in-person associates event of the academic year. So I'm very excited. We started out, uh, for those of you who are here for it, with the uh, CEPR Prize being awarded to Ben Bernanke. And here we are wrapping up with the recent Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy, Ben Harris. So it's been a very exciting year. We've got lots more excitement coming down the pike in the upcoming year. For example, nine months from tomorrow, the CEPR Economic Summit, March 1. <laughs> and yes, I already have my first invitation out. Still waiting to hear back, so we're already hard at work on next year's programming. But I just want to thank all of you for being with us, and especially thank you to Ben Harris for taking time to join, with, join us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. See you soon, everyone. Thank you again. <clears throat> that was fun.